that might have a real impact. You know what he did? Right. He prayed. He prayed yeah, he decided maybe now will be the time I'll pray while I'm right at the edge of the world here getting ready to fall off. So he, he gets on his knees and he goes, God, I am really in trouble here. Now, you know I've been a pretty good guy. I've given occasionally to the church. And there have been times I've been nice to my wife, and I've actually been kind to my children on more than one occasion. You know I have, God. Don't we do that when we pray? We want to put our bona fides out there and try and set ourselves up for God, because maybe he forgot who we were, and we need to remind him how good we are. Maybe that's how it is. But anyway, so he says, God, I've got to win the lottery tonight. So, God... Let me win the lottery tonight. He gets up the next morning, looks at the newspaper. Somebody else won the lottery. <sighs> what am I going to do, God? So the next draw day comes, and he starts all over again. God, you know I'm desperate. You know I need it. I need this money. I'm going to lose everything. Everybody's going to know the truth about me if I don't win the lottery. I've got to win the lottery tonight, God. Please, God, let me win the lottery. He goes to bed the next morning, looks at the paper. Somebody else won the lottery. Man, he is absolutely at the edge of his mind. He goes out in the front yard of his house, and he starts screaming at God. Don't we do that sometimes? We start really getting God in our sights, and we start giving him the what for. God, don't you know I need this? So he gives it to him all over. God, I got money problems. I got health problems. I got wife problems. I got every problem there could possibly. God, I got to win the lottery. And suddenly the sky grows dark and splits open with a big bolt of lightning that lands right next to him. And this amazing, booming voice comes from heaven and says, Joe, could you at least meet me halfway and buy a ticket? <laughs> Aren't we that way? We demand everything from God, and we forget to get involved in the process. Amen? Amen. Can I read you a little bit of scripture while right. you're having your dinner today? I'm going to read from uh, Matthew. I'm going to be in the sixth chapter. I'm going to read the fifth through the eighth verses. I'm reading from the NIV. Jesus speaking, and this is right in the middle of what we've come to call the Sermon on the Mount. So it's right the main course of what Jesus is speaking to us about. And he says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Man, that's painful. That's painful. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they receive their reward in full. We all know somebody that will get up and pre-pray for hours and we'll, we'll go, oh man, that guy can pray. But is that guy praying or is that guy trying to get seen? Jesus says, I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full, but when you pray, so he's talking directly to you and me. You got that? He's for you and me. He says, but when you pray, go into your room and close the door and pray to your father. You know why that was important? Because they were talking about a storage room, because that would have been the only room in a house that actually had a door. Otherwise, they would have just had like a curtain between the doorways in each room. So this was a truly private place in that day and age. And your father, who is unseen, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And verse 7, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Now, we misinterpret what they're talking about there. The pagans had a ton of gods, and they didn't know which god did what. So they would start praying and naming every god in the hope that they would hit the right god for their need at that moment. That's what this is talking about there. And then it goes on to say, and this is the most important verse for you, and for me, do not be like them, for your Father, who knows what you need before you ask him. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Amen. Before you even ask him, he knows what you need. Let me give you a furthering <coughs> point on that. Most of us know what we have come to be to call the Lord's Prayer, right? 
That's actually the very next set of verses that follow what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is saying what we should and how we should pray. And then he does it, he goes even farther for us, because we're kind of knuckleheads and we get a little thick headed and we don't always get all the instructions, right? So Jesus now gives us that prayer. And right in the middle of that prayer, which is right in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, so it must be pretty important, he says this in verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. If you say that Lord's Prayer, it's the only place in all of that prayer where there's a physical need that's met. Everything else is either giving praise and honor to God or trusting Him to give you what you need spiritually to get through the rest of that day. The only thing that he says I'll give you is your daily bread. So he need, does what our need is, right? But we live in America. And America says you should need more than that. I'm getting a t-shirt made, I think, because some of you that have known me for a long time, you know I talk a lot about Corvettes. I've owned a lot of Corvettes in my life. I love Corvettes. I really do. I really would like to have another new Corvette. I might even like that new mid-engine that's coming out new next year. Man, those are cool. I love a Corvette. Anybody else like a really cool car like that? Man, I would. <laughs> so I'm getting me a t-shirt that says, I need Jesus more than I need a new Corvette. Because a lot of the times I'm confused about what I need and what I want. I don't know about you all. But I am. Well, I got to tell you a little story. And when I start out by saying I got to tell you a little story, I got to tell you a little story to get you ready for the little story. Is that okay? <laughs> so I, I get the public speak quite a bit. And when I go, different people introduce me in different ways. Brother Bill introduces me as well as any, but they will give some different criteria and stuff about my background or what my titles are, or my education. But I had one guy one time, and he says, well, I want you all to meet what I consider to be one of the best storytelling pastors I've ever met, Pastor Michael Dunn. And I was so offended. Pastor Michael, a storyteller? You see, when I was a kid, my mother would come after me when I told a story. And she'd give me what for? <laughs> called me a storyteller. So as soon as I heard that, I said, he's calling me a liar. <laughs> so the truth was that as I thought about that, it became honoring. Because our Lord and Savior was a great storytelling preacher. Mm -hmm. And so he would tell stories to be able to get his point across, right? So may I tell you a story? Now, a lot of you have been on this journey with me for a while, and a lot of you know the story of this miracle Rolex, right? A lot of you know that story? Well, it's well detailed in this book, A Man of Miracles, Shameless Plug. And uh, so if you want to know more about it, please pick up the book, my son Ryan. I'm more than happy to take your money. Another shameless plug, please forgive me. Uh, so uh, anyway, in the, uh, I, I was given this Rolex watch about three years ago. It was a miraculous event. I've talked about it before. I talk about it in much greater detail in the book. But as I got the watch and we passed it around and I wound up getting it back eventually after two years, when I got it back, it had never run very well. It had always kept bad time and the date would catch up in the date window it would stay there like halfway, like, I don't know what day I want to be in. <laughs> kind of like me sometimes, I guess. And so uh, I, I had it sitting on my desk at home, and we had had some construction work done in our house. And while the contractor came over to get his check ostensibly, and he said he was there just to do a walkthrough and make sure it was all done properly, but could you make sure you're there? And by the way, I'll pick up my last check while I'm there. You know how those contractors. Any contractors are just defended. Okay. So, and, so anyway, he's walking through, and as I'm sitting at my desk and he's inspecting our house, he sees this sitting on my desk next to me, and he goes, 
that's a nice watch. I, I had a Submariner once. And so I said, yeah, really? And I never miss an opportunity to give honor and glory to God. And so I, I said, you know, this is a miracle watch. And he goes, huh? And I said, would you like me to tell you the story? And he said, yes. So I tell this hardened guy the story of this watch. And about halfway through, he literally drops into a chair in my office and starts to weep. And he goes, man, that just is such a powerful story. And so I thanked him. We prayed together. And that man accepted Jesus Christ in the living room of my house while he was holding this watch. Right. Now the watch has got no power at all. I've got no power at all. You've got no power at all. We have a choice about whether we profit our kingdom and tell about our Lord, or we keep it as a lamp with a shade over our life. So I choose to be kind of bright. You can have that choice too. You're just as capable as me. You just have to choose to do it. And so at the end of our conversation, he says, I told him, I said, well, the only problem with the watch is it doesn't run very well. And he goes, yeah, those older ones are like that. And I had been told the watch was worth about $10,000 at that point. And so uh, he's, I said, you know, what I need is I need to get it fixed, but I'm on a pretty tight budget. So he said, well, look, that's amazing. And I love it when somebody says this, but you're not going to believe this. That's my favorite tagline in the world. You're not going to believe this. You'll see it all the way through this book, which is available today. <laughs> <laughs> So he tells me about a guy that uh, he says, I'll get you his number, but he's a retired master Rolex jeweler. And he works out of his home. And you can go there, and he'll do the work on it there. And I said, is he trustworthy? Oh, yeah, the guy's amazing. You'll love him. I said, OK. So a couple of days later, he texts me this guy's phone number. And the gentleman's name was Gordon. Hang on to that. The guy's name is Gordon. Pretty cool. Not a lot of people named Gordon anymore. So I called Gordon and I said, Gordon, no answer. Gordon? And then a voice that sounds like a robot comes on. This is Gordon. I am here if you'd like to speak to me. And then it went dead. I'm thinking, this is a recording. So I start to leave a message. Uh, Hi, Gordon. This is uh, Pastor Michael. I've got a Rolex. Can you give me a call back? I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> so I make an appointment to come over to Gordon's house. You've been to Gordon's house? I have. Yeah. So I get to Gordon's house. Well, don't, 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 don't be a spoiler. Spoiler alert here. So I, I get to Gordon's, I go to Gordon's house. And uh, before I get there, Gordon says to me in this C-3PO voice, this robot voice, he says, don't be tardy. Don't be tardy? Who the heck says tardy? <laughs> so I drive up to the driveway, and I'm as close to being on time as you can with a malfunctioning Rolex. And I get, walk up to the door, and I, as I'm uh, walking up to the door, it's just this beautifully, neatly trimmed front yard. It's got a flagpole with an American flag kind of lightly lapping the wind out front. The garage door is open. There's two beautifully clean, newer cars inside the garage. And as I walk up the door, I kind of notice all this. I get to the door, ring the doorbell, no answer. I ring the doorbell again, no answer. I knock on the door, no answer. So me, Mr. Loving Man of Grace, goes, tardy. <laughs> Who's tardy now, Gordon? <laughs> And then I hear a voice behind me. <clears throat> I'm over here. <laughs> so I look around. I don't see him. Over here. I still don't see him. But I start walking towards the voice. And as I come around the corner of his sidewalk to get in front of his garage, here's Gordon in front of me. Now let me describe to you what I saw. A guy in his 80s in a wheelchair. And I'm talking old school Push it yourself, wheelchair. I'm a man. I don't need nobody pushing me through the airport wheelchair. With no legs from the hips down. And I was like, 
that big. And so I said to Gordon, hi, I'm Michael. I know who you are. It's one o'clock, so we're kind of help me. <laughs> right on. Follow me. He spins his chair without another word and starts wheeling himself between the two cars. As I walk by the cars, one of them's got a bumper sticker. And it says, proud and wounded World War II veteran. Wow. So now I get the whole story. I know what's going on. Because, you know, I'm a real smart pastor, you know. So now I'm scared to death that I get into the garage and this guy's going to start beating me up or stabbing me with the bandana of an M1 Garand or something. He's going to go all PTSD on me. So we get to the end of the wooden ramp. And he opens up the door to a little office in the back of his garage that he's basically had made for himself. And he wheels up inside and says, follow. Not follow me. Not gifted conversationalist, Gordon, is he? And uh, so I follow Gordon in, and Gordon now rolls right up to his workbench. Now inside this little office, it looks like a going out of business jewelry store. He's got an empty glass display case, and like the necklace mannequins, but they got no jewelry on them. It's like it's all set and ready to go, but it's long gone kind of thing, you know what I mean? And so uh, he wheels up to the, to the workbench where he's working. But he can get so much closer to the bench, not being disrespectful, he's got a leg. So I, I got to sit back from it. And there's a big light right in front of it. So I sit down next to him and it says, the watch. Oh, that's what I call it too, the watch. So I'm thinking God's already spoken to him, you know. And I said, oh yes, the watch. And he goes, no, the one you want fixed. And I said, this is, this is it. So he gets it, and he's got it under the light, and he's looking at the watch, this very watch. And as he's looking at it, I'm asking him questions. Now, my gifted conversationalist friend, Gordon, his average response was, hmm, just hmm. <laughs> so as he's looking at the watch, he says, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, it doesn't keep very good time, and the date doesn't stay locked properly. Hmm. I said, do you think you can fix it? Of course I can fix it. I'm a Rolex master jeweler. And I got him talking. <laughs> and so he's looking at it under the light, and I'm thinking he's upset, and he just seems so mean and grumpy and angry. I was positive that this was an angry man. So while he's holding the watch, I said, you know, that watch has got a pretty amazing story, but I'm pretty nervous about telling it again. And he says, Hmm. I said, would you like to hear the story? Well, you know what he said. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. So, so anyway, I tell him the story of the Miracle Rolex watch, which, by the way, is available in this book. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so anyway, it, as I'm talking to him, he's not saying a word. It's almost like he's become transfixed with my watch, with the bracelet around his hand, under the light, just staring at it. He's not moving, he's not even saying hmm anymore. Completely quiet. And so what happens is, while I'm telling him this story, I suddenly realize that this guy is super angry because he's got no legs. And he's super angry at God that he's got no legs. This is what I'm thinking to myself because, well, I am the world-renowned pastor, Michael Duffy, right? I should know these things. I should know exactly what somebody wants. I pride myself on discernment as my gift, so this has got to be what it is. And as I continue to tell the story, I'm praying to God, 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 you know who it is here. It's your man. I want Gordon to have legs. And I actually move my chair back so that when they come on him and he rolls backwards, I'll be there to be able to share it with him. So nothing's happening. But I know sometimes you got to mix a little spit with mud to get miracles to happen. Amen? Amen? And so I'm now praying even harder and at the same time telling this story. They say they can't melt the task. I beg to differ. And so as I'm praying about this and nothing's happening. I'm becoming more and more disappointed that I am not able to bring this guy home.
hope and joy, which has always been my ministry, to bring hope to hopeless people. Well, when my little dialogue is over, and I stretch it, baby, much longer than it is in A Man of Miracles, but as I stretch this story out as long as I could, hoping that God would, who might need a little extra time, maybe he's busy someplace else, he needs a little extra time to get back over here and put legs on Gordon. I realized there was no more time and I was done. And there was a just a deathly silence in the room. And Gordon wheels his chair three quarters turned to me and he's crying like a baby silently. Do you know what Gordon said to me? He said, I am so glad you came here today. I was totally out of hope. Yeah, that's exactly what he said. I was totally out of hope and I did not care whether I lived or died after today. And after hearing all about what you've been through in this watch, the things that I'm going through must have a reason too. And I just need to hang on a little longer to see what it is. And then he went right back into Gordon and said, I'll have it ready in a week, I'll call you. And I was dismissed. Now as I'm walking out to the car, I'm absolutely shell-shocked <coughs> by what's just happened. And as I sit down in my car, I, I can't even put the key in the ignition. And God out of nowhere says, do you get what just happened? No. No, I do not. I was praying for legs for this guy. I was sure that's what he needed. And God said this clear as we are speaking here today. He said, you have a problem. And it's a problem that's within my kingdom. That you decide what somebody needs and then you pray for them. A wiser choice would be to ask me what they need and then pray with me. And then God said something to me that has stuck with me for the two years since I met Gordon, and it's this. He needed hope to live on much more than he needed legs to walk on. And that's where we are, men. We need the hope of God more than we need a new Corvette. No matter what it is you think you want, you better make sure with God that it's really what you need. Because you're probably praying wrong and getting limited results. So what's the miracle here? Is the miracle what I learned there? In a way, the miracle is knowledge. Knowledge. If we don't know what we're supposed to be praying about, thinking about, and doing, we're not going to do it right. So God gave me knowledge that day. In fact, the ultimate door to the miraculous of God is labeled knowledge. Right above that door, it says knowledge. God gave me the knowledge that Gordon really wanted hope when I was sure he wanted legs. And God said something very important to me. Ask me what they need first. Ask me what they need first. And then pray for them to receive what I say they need. And not what they or you think they need. How often does a brother or sister or family member come to you and say, I really need this. And as they're telling you what they need, you know in your head or in your heart, that's not what you need. But we don't say it. Okay, I'll pray for that lottery ticket for you. I quickly said, I got it, Lord. And men, I want to know to you, are you getting it? Are you getting what God's saying to us? You need to ask God for what you actually need in your life to really start living your life abundantly. And receiving what God determines that we need is the only miracle we should all be praying to receive. It is the only truly valuable miracle for we folks or for the folks that we love. It's the only truly valuable miracle for us or the people that we love in our lives. 
That miracle is always going to be enough. Man, I just got to challenge you, and that's what I like to do because God challenges me, and I'm supposed to pass it down the line. It's time to loosen our grips on what we are demanding to receive from God. It's time to loosen our grips on what we are demanding to receive from God. The things that we are positive, we think we need from God. May I make a suggestion to you, men? May I? May sure. I speak into you today? Right now, why don't we ask God this question? Lord, what is it I lack? What do I really need, God, to live abundantly for your glory and my good? Because those are synonymous. God's glory is always going to be your good. Praise God. And then I want you to do something. You're going to need to hang on and get ready to live in a miraculous, caring environment presented and taken care of for you by the Lord. You don't need to have a valuable timepiece on your wrist to give you worth. You don't need a vintage Rolex to get you to tell you what time it is. You already know what time it is, now don't you? You really do. It's time for you to have hope. Yeah, you know it is. You're not here by accident today. It's not coincidence that I was here on this date when I was actually scheduled for August. There are folks in here today that are no different than Gordon. You may be missing some part of your life. Maybe a leg. But the hope is the one thing that you have come here for today, and you may not have even known it. I hope that you will before you leave today. I'd really like to see that miracle happen for each and every one of you. That's my prayer for you here today. Now, I'll finish with the end of the story. A week later, Gordon calls me and tells me that the watch is ready. And I go back to get the watch, and when I go into Gordon's office. Gordon sits down and he tells me what a good week he has had. That he just loved working on the watch. And when he showed it to me, it looked brand new. Everything worked. He didn't say, I'm not going to charge you, but everything worked. And he said it was really nice. And, uh, and then we got to talking because in an earlier life, I used to have very expensive watches. They're my fetish, if you will. And when I got this watch, I was positive it was a fake because current Submariners, they have an orange outline around the white letters that are on the outer band, and mine had always had those. So this one does not, and I thought it was fake. So I said to Gordon, I said, you know, what? what's the story on this? And he said, well, they serial number on a Rolex watch matches the year, it's the year designation is on the serial number for the, for the watch. And he said they started making Rolex Submariners in 1954. Now, I don't believe in coincidences, but I was born in 1954. And he says uh, the very earliest of those models had just a white letter, just a white numeral no outer color. And I said, really? So is this an older? I knew it was already old, but I didn't know how old. And he said, this was made in 1954. It's one of the original Submariners. <laughs> and I said, wow, that's amazing. I said, it's amazing that it's still running. My wife says that about me a lot. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but the bottom line was is that I said, could you figure how much it's worth? And of course, Gordon immediately says, of course I can, I'm a Rolex master jeweler. And he says that he has kind of a marketplace facilitating collectors with vintage Rolexes. And I said, well, what would you estimate its value at? He said, this watch is so rare that in the condition that it's in right now, without the original box or any of the stuff, it's worth twenty-five dollars to $30,000. Now, my wife and I, to this day, could use twenty-five or thirty thousand. I don't know about anybody else in here, but we definitely could. And so, uh, he said, "I've got somebody that'll buy it this afternoon for cash. Would you like to sell it today?" Hmm. And I looked at Gordon and I said, "Hmm, 